Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Paul Lee. I'm a science administrator at the Gladstone Institutes and a faculty member in the Cognitive Sciences at UC Berkeley. Uh, today, we're going to kick off our new initiative coming out from the Gladstone Institutes called Open Classroom Talks, where we send our scientists outside to Bay Area communities, such as Google, to share their interdisciplinary research. So uh, to start off our um, open classroom talks. So I'd like to introduce you to our guest speaker for today, Dr. Katie Pollard, who is a senior investigator at the Gladstone Institutes and a professor in human genetics and biostatistics at UCSF. She received her PhD from UC Berkeley, where she developed computationally intensive statistical methods for analysis of microarray data for, with applications in cancer biology. For her postdoctoral work, also at Berkeley, she developed Bioconductor open source software packages for clustering and multiple hypothesis testing. Katie was also part of the Chimpanzee Sequencing Analysis Consortium that published a sequence of the chimp genome. And she used the sequence to identify the fastest evolving regions in the human genome. In 2005, she joined the faculty at the UC Davis Genome Center and the Department of Statistics before moving to UCSF in fall 2008. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Katie Pollard, everyone. Hi, everybody. It's an honor to be here today. I thought I would start, you just heard who I am. I thought I'd start by asking a little bit about you guys and what brought you to the talk today. Um, so how many people um, here are programmers in the room? All right, a bunch of programmers. Um, how many of you work with big data sets? How many um, are, have a biology interest or background? A few? OK, great. Um, and how many of you are interested about your own microbiome, like you came because you're curious about yourself? OK, good. All right. So there's a lot of reasons um, to, to be here and learn something at this Gladstone Open Classroom. I'm really pleased to be here, as Paul mentioned. Um, from my background, I haven't been working on the human microbiome since you know, undergrad or a long time ago. I was working in human genetics, and in particular, asking what's unique about the human genome, what makes us different from chimpanzees and other animals. And I um, made some really exciting discoveries in that realm, and I was working really hard um, to use comparative and computational approaches to decipher human DNA. And there's a chunk of my lab that still works on that. And uh, it's, it's a great interest of mine. But um, about a decade ago, a colleague who's a microbiologist said to me, sort of prodding me, said, you know, most of the DNA um, in the human body isn't encoded in the human genome. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And he said, no, really, it's not. Most of the DNA comes from microbes. And I you know, eventually believed him. But then I thought, well, they're just kind of along for the ride on our body. You know, this isn't really significant. And, it, and I'm studying the human DNA, which is going to explain who we are and why we're different from each other and why we get diseases. Um, but slowly, the more I looked into it, I realized that the, um, the facts really support the idea that um, the human microbiome not only is a large contribution to our biological makeup, but that it's not just a passive contribution, that the microbial cells in our bodies, which are bacterial, they're um, microbial eukaryotes like yeasts. They're archaea, which are a sort of underappreciated part of the microbial tree of life. Um, and they're also viruses that don't have cells at all, but are just molecules in our body. All of those organisms together are um, not just along for the ride, they're interacting with our cells and forming essentially um, additional organs or parts of organs in our body. And the genes encoded in their DNA are making proteins and they're making the majority of the proteins in our body. And since proteins are the things that uh, are the basic building blocks of life, it would be completely um, irresponsible to not be looking at the microbial DNA to try to understand human biology. Now, the first bullet point there about cells outnumbering by 10 to 1, there was actually, if anyone caught it, an article just this week saying that that um, estimate might be off by an order of magnitude. And so maybe about half the cells are human and half microbial, not 10 to 1. But either way, um, there's certainly a lot of microbial cells in our body, trillions, so like uh, more than the dollars in the national debt, might be an example. And so that's a very big number. And, um, and because they're not all 
our cells in our body, all the trillions of cells that are human, have the same DNA in them, modulo, cancer, and some occasional other mutations that happen. But the microbial cells are all different types. They're different organisms, different species from one another. So they have a lot of different genomes. And that's why, uh, regardless of whether the cells are approximately equal or 10 to 1, the genes, the pieces of DNA that encode proteins, are really are primarily microbial, regardless of the cell count. So, um, so we have these microbes in our bodies. And so why was I so oblivious to this um, when I was trotting along looking at the human DNA? Um, and, and why is this sort of a hot topic all of a sudden that we're seeing in you know, the New Yorker or other news that we might read? Um, the microbes have been there. They've been evolving with us as a species. They're on plants. They're on other animals. So why were we kind of not so tuned into them? Well, it seems a bit surprising because people have been um, aware of microbes for hundreds of years. Um, but until about 10, 15 years ago, it was impossible to study most of the microbes um, because the classic approach was to extract them from their natural environment, which in this case is our body, and try to grow them in these dishes in the lab and try to figure out what they are and what they do. Um, but the vast majority of microbes that live in the human body, and in fact in most environments, can't survive in the lab environment because the conditions aren't right and because they can't survive alone. This approach takes one type of microbe and tries to grow it in isolation. And these communities are made up of different types of microbes that are all interacting with each other. So trying to grow them in this way just doesn't work. So they're not amenable to this direct study by microbiological techniques. But the advent of two technologies that are the absolute sort of basis for all the work that we do in my lab um, have enabled us to get over this hurdle, which is um, that we can footprint or measure what's there by looking at their DNA. And so we, that is possible because of next generation or low cost high throughput sequencing that you can extract DNA from the community without the cells needing to be able to grow in the lab. You can just directly assay it. So if I wanted to study your microbiome here in the room today, I could pass around a test tube and have you spit in the tube. If I wanted to study the microbes in your saliva or in your mouth, uh, I could collect a stool sample to, collect, to study your gut microbiome. Or I could actually go in and like take some of your skin or take a biopsy. Um, some of those are more invasive. but but as you can see, it's pretty easy to just extract some bodily fluid or tissue, and then I can extract DNA, sequence it. And then um, the other technology that's essential for this work is high performance computing, which should be no surprise to a Google audience. But it, the data sets um, from a single saliva sample could be up to a few terabytes. And if I want to analyze a bunch of these and compare them to each other and do modeling, I need high performance computing. So. Um, because of, of low-cost, high-throughput sequencing and advances in computing, it's become possible now to study microbial communities in the human body and also in natural environments. Um, and the basic questions that in any of these samples that one wanna, wants to ask are who's there, so what types of microbes are there, and we call this a taxonomic profile. Or what, and also, and perhaps more importantly, what are they doing? So what genes, what proteins are encoded in their genome, and what does that say about how they might be interacting with our human cells or affecting our health? So an example would be um, that uh, microbes in your microbiome might encode an enzyme that would metabolize a drug that you take. So we are probably all aware of the idea of personalized or precision medicine. This has been in the news a lot. And the idea is that when you go into the doctor's office and a drug is prescribed, that the type of drug or the dose might depend on your own genetic makeup, that different people respond differently or need different doses or have different adverse reactions that other people don't have. Well, your microbiome is also involved intricately in metabolism of a drug. and so. Knowing that you had a microbe that was going to inactivate a particular drug would be really helpful information. Um, it would also be helpful to know if your microbiome was going to extract more energy or less energy from your food than somebody else's, or make your gut membrane more permeable, or cause more inflammation or less inflammation. Um, 
or uh, just be a signature for where you grew up or where you came from or how you were raised um, or how many times you've ever taken antibiotics. Um, does it encode antibiotic resistant genes? So there are a lot of really interesting questions we can ask if we know who's there and what they're doing. So um, I should have said at the beginning, also I'm happy to take questions during the talk if anything's not clear, please. Please interrupt me. I don't want this to be formal. Um, and, I'm, and I will also take questions at the end. So um, how do we do this? Since there's some data scientists and programmers in the room, I won't go into a lot of technical detail, but I wanted to give you some of the detail of what this computation looks like. So the, the data set, as I said, can be a huge file or a database, um, terabytes of data. So what is it? Um, these are DNA or RNA or, or proteins, different kinds of biomolecules. But let's just take DNA as an example. And uh, we read sequences, little fragments from the genomes of all the organisms that are in the sample. And those fragments um, would be typically on the order of 100 base pairs or a couple hundred base pairs, base pairs being A's, C's, T's, and G's that encode genetic information. So um, one sample, like your saliva sample that I would collect in a test tube, we might obtain on the order of, say, uh, 50 million of these 100-letter long sequences from it. So that's the file or the database that I would create. And that's what I'm calling the metagenome here. These little lines represent the sequences. And there's not 50 million lines there, but it's just a representation. So if I want to know what's there, um, and what those, what functions are encoded or what genes those fragments came from. Um, the basic thing that we do, and this is um, sort of, there are many variants of it, but the basic idea is we compare that to a database of sequences that we've seen before, um, either directly to the sequences or to a model, um, which is a more sensitive way of comparing the sequences a model of what certain gene families look like. So we can do a probabilistic comparison to the model or a direct comparison. And um, we, my lab didn't in, invent sequence alignment or hom what we call here homology search. So seeing if a sequence looks like is similar enough to say it's the same as one of these sequences. But we spend a lot of time tuning those algorithms so they work with these really big data sets of little fragments that come, uh, unlike other types of genomic data, they come from lots of different organisms many of which we've never seen the genome of before. So there won't be any perfect matches in the database. So since a lot of people here probably think about search, that's kind of the challenge. Yeah? Just a question on that. Were you models yes. or something that, in which ones, for example? Yeah, so um, for the um, protein sequence databases, um, there's at the NCBI a non-redundant sequence database that has everything that's ever been publicly deposited. Um, and uh, with direct exact copies deleted. So there's non-redundant means one copy of each. There's also genomes that we can download. So we can align not to gene sequences, but to whole genomes. Um, so we have all the genomes. There's about 30,000 genomes that have been sequenced so far, most of which are microbial. Those are available through NCBI. A slightly curated version of them is available through a database called Patrick that's hosted in the UK. Um, there's data resources in the U.S. mostly through NCBI and in Europe mostly through the European Bioinformatics Institute or EBI. They have mostly the same data in them. There are some smaller sort of niche databases. And in terms of annotation, there's a bunch of functional annotations that get laid on top of these sequences, such as the pathways that they're in. KEG is an example of a database, the Kyoto Encyclopedia. Um, so that we also have a lot of annotations um, that would be layered on top of the sequences. So after we find a match, we can see what's known about that sequence. Um, does that answer? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe just one quick follow-up. Yeah. Is that a problem for so many databases? And is there any effort to sort of unify standards there? Yeah. It, um, it can be a problem because each one is quite large. And if you want to host this locally, it can be kind of an unbearable amount of data. Um, there um, are differences in results if you use one database versus another. We had a paper this past year showing that the, you know, we studied some ocean data and showed that you come to completely different conclusions about photosynthesis. And it's like at different times of day and different times of year based on which gene database you use. So it is a problem. Um, 
There's a group called the Genomic Standards Consortium um, that's attempting to do, establish some standards in this field. And actually, the White House is really interested in this. So I made several visits to the White House in the past year to talk about data standards for this field because it's a little bit wild west right now. Is that the GA for GH? The what? The GA for GH, the Global Alliance for Genomics. Um, no, actually, so this is specific to microbiome. Um, it may be kind of connected with that, but that would be a broader initiative that would cover other types of data, not just microbiome data. Um, this was specifically around the microbiome, and it was called the Unified Microbiome Project. So, um, but a lot of them have the same people and the just overlapping people in the discussions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the data curation is an, a really important aspect. Um, and um, we've spent some time, um, I think we're one of the only labs that's, that's uh, stopped to ask if it actually matters which database you use or exactly what runtime parameters you use for these blast search. So if you change your cutoffs or your pre-processing of the data, we've seen that can have a huge effect on the biological conclusions. And that's been, I think, underappreciated in the field. So we've been kind of uh, a bit curmudgeon but spending a lot of time sort of figuring out um, how these choices and the analysis pipelines affect the conclusions that someone makes. And we can do that with either gold standard data sets where we're pretty sure we know the answer, or we also do a lot of simulations. So we take all the genomes that are out there, we create metagenomic communities, we fragment them up into, and simulate the sequencing experiment on the computer. And then since we made the community, we know the answer and we can see in which situations you make false conclusions or overestimate things. So it's not perfect because it doesn't capture all the noise in re real life, but it's nice because we can see where things break down by trying a lot of different scenarios. So the basic output is a count of the number of reads that hits a taxonomic group, like a particular type of bacteria or a function, a protein family. Um, and part of this sort of rigorous evaluation we've done has shown that you have to normalize in a variety of ways. So a long gene, just by chance, you'll get more sequences from it. But it doesn't mean there's more copies of the gene. It just means it's longer. That's a really simple example. But there's a lot of other biases in these experiments that need to be accounted for for accurate quantification. Accurate quantification is important if you want to compare across samples. Maybe within a sample, it's not so important. But if I want to compare my microbiome to a bunch of other people's or do a big meta-analysis of publicly available data, I need these measurements to be meaningful, biologically meaningful and comparable across samples. And that's a huge problem in the field right now. And we have to point that out. So one of the more um, often touted associations between the microbiome and human biology is a, a reported association with human um, body mass index. So an argument was made uh, here under uh, where it says lay, and you see the purple bars. That was an early study with um, 19 people in it, 12 of which were obese, seven lean. And there was more of a particular phylum of bacteria called firmicutes, which is the x-axis proportion of the sequencing library that was firmicutes. There was more in the obese people. So um, it was concluded that the microbiome was associated with obesity and perhaps even playing a causal role in obesity or mediating um, effects that would um, on obesity. And then in difference, we did a meta-analysis um, about two years ago now. Uh, where we looked across different data sets that either were designed to look at obesity or weren't. They were just random samples of people, but they had lean and obese individuals in the study. And what we found was um, if you don't do a careful job normalizing the data, and even if you do, there's some account unaccounted variability that actually results in two things. So the first one is that you don't see a consistent association with obesity. In these data sets, there actually isn't more firmicutes in the obese people in general, especially as the study sizes get larger, like they are on the other side in the pink and green bars. But more upsetting to me was that this biomarker for obesity, that a lot of firmicutes varied more between the studies than it did between the lean and obese in each study. And so something, and this isn't um, a very um, sort of fine resolution measurement. Firmicutes are, are one of the two most prevalent phyla of bacteria, phylum being like the highest taxonomic level. So 
a lot of the sequencing, there were millions and millions of sequencing reads supporting these estimates of the amount of firmicutes, and yet they still got, in some studies, like 20% firmicutes on average across lots of people, and in other studies, 80%. So there are a number of technical reasons why that might be. There could be also biological reasons, like these are different study populations, adults, um, living in different parts of the world. Some of them are college students, maybe different diets or lifestyles. Um, so some of this could be real biological differences between the populations, and some of it, I'm sure, is also technical differences in how they did the experiment. So there's a bunch of issues that I'm not going to go into in detail, but just um, something that might be interesting for you to know is when you see a headline, the microbiome causes this or is associated with that, there's um, I think in the field right now, a lot of bias still, and a lot of, I'm afraid that a lot of those results aren't going to replicate when someone does another study, that people are sort of overfitting data on a particular study or that has a particular bias in how the measurements were made. And this isn't so shocking. This is a new technology. There's a lot of excitement, and, and there are a lot of real promise around it as well. But with any new technology that comes online, I think it takes a little while to figure out what all the hitches are. And I think we're still figuring that out with microbiome experiments right now. Um, but I'm, I'm not totally pessimistic. There, our lab and a number of other groups around the world are working hard to solve these problems. So I think there is a lot of promise for this approach. But I also think there's a lot of sort of noisy and contradictory data out there right now. Um, so luckily, yeah, some of these problems that, that we observe in the data can be modeled and corrected for in the analysis. So um, we generate a little bit of this kind of data in my own lab, but the main thing um, we uh, create our research program around is data mining. So um, a lot of people deposit not only genome sequences for microbes, but these metagenomic experiments where they've sampled people with different traits from different parts of the world and also non-human primates or other um, organisms, microbiomes. And most of this data is publicly available, so the details don't matter. But this is just a list of uh, a bunch of the larger studies. And this isn't all the data that's out there. We have, at this point, close to two terabytes of data on our lab server that we've downloaded from public resources. But for this, these particular comparisons, we grab a certain subset of the data sets, and this can be on the order of sort of tens of terabytes of data. Um, and you can see that the people who've been studied are from a number of different countries. Um, and uh, excitingly, and I'll show some of this later in the talk, um, like any uh, new sort of field of biomedicine, at first most of the people who are studied are North Americans and Europeans and maybe someone from Japan or China. But uh, there have been a few studies in um, individuals living in non-industrialized countries that are revealing some really big differences in the microbiome that I'll touch on. So um, with all the caveats of issues of data uh, quality and uh, normalization in mind, I, I want to um, nonetheless share with you some of the things that our field has discovered about the microbiome. Um, some of these are our work in my lab, and some of them are work of other colleagues. So, What's come to light, and, and perhaps some of you know this already, that one of the strongest drivers of differences between microbiomes between different people is um, what you eat. So what we put into our bodies is the energy um, source also for our microbiome. And so depending on diet, we see large differences. And um, these are pretty massive differences, like on the scale of what I showed you of those differences between studies and the amount of firmicutes. Someone could have 20% and someone else could have 80% of their sequencing um, be from firmicutes. And that can be flipped within about 24 hours by changing what you ate. So it's not what you ate 50 years ago for the most part but what you literally just ate. So um, a friend and colleague at UCSF, Peter Turnbow, has done experiments where he switches people between different diets and sees these rapid shifts. Others have looked in infants, and there's some differences um, between breastfeeding and formula, also between cesarean and vaginal birth, because you pick up your, the womb, womb is sterile, and you get your initial inoculate during birth um, that can affect you for several um, years. Um, and perhaps have long-term effects on your health. 
Switching between a vegan and a meat diet has a huge effect on your, the composition of your gut microbiome. Um, and you, those effects are seen uh, quickly within a day or so of shifting and can be shifted back by just changing the diet back. Um, and despite the sort of inconsistent results we see when we just sample people and ask, we see no association if we just sample them and ask if their microbiome is associated with how, their body mass index, so how obese they are. Yet there is some relationship because you can take the microbiome of an obese person or an obese mouse that was created genetically in the case of the mouse or by diet. You can transfer fecal matter to a mouse that doesn't have a microbiome that's been raised germ-free, and you can induce some of the aspects like some weight gain and some metabolic differences. So these shifts in the microbiome that I'm describing in response to diet can have physiological effects and could, in theory, affect something like obesity, even though we don't see a, a simple signature for that when we look at the whole data set. So there, there may still be, uh, I, I'm not uh, proposing that there's no relationship with obesity, because in an experimental system, we can control it. But it, out in the population, there's too many other things going on to see that kind of association. Um, the microbiome isn't just responding to our diet um, for its own sake, but it's also producing a lot of molecules uh, from our diet to help us to harvest energy, synthesize vitamins, so a bunch of things that happen during digestion, or as I mentioned earlier in metabolizing a drug, a bunch of those things cannot happen without the microbiome. So we're working on a study right now where um, a, a very toxic metabolite that um, causes liver damage, um, it can be um, eliminated by just changing the microbiome, essentially. So um, there are a lot of not just their genes, but the byproducts of those genes, of the pathways that those genes encode, a lot of the molecules in our body that cause health or disease are being produced by the microbiome, sometimes multiple microbes. So to make that end product that say anti-inflammatory might take several different microbes contributing and maybe some human genes too. So it can be quite complicated, not as easy as remove this one microbe or add this, this other one in many cases. Um, and the gut microbiome, which is the, the main source that so we have microbes all over our body, on our skin, and our ears, and our noses, and pretty much um, even parts of our body we thought were sterile previously, like the heart. Um, but the, the biggest chunk of the microbes in our body is in our gut. Um, by weight, most of us have about six pounds of microbes that are in our body, and like four pounds or so of that is the gut microbiome. Um, but it's not only important for digestion. The gut microbiome is also communicating with your immune system, hormones, and, and some work I find really fascinating through the vagus nerve, which is how our brain controls how our gut works, and communication between our gut and our brain. Through the vagus nerve, the microbiome can communicate with our brain, and it, that communication is associated with things like mood, depression. Um, and certain behaviors, and perhaps there's some new evidence, also autism. So um, there, the gut microbiome isn't just about the gut. It's also affecting um, a lot of other systems in our body. And so not surprisingly, there's every week a paper coming out now showing that the microbiome is associated with a different disease. As I mentioned, I'm fearful that some of those may not replicate. Um, but nonetheless, there are a number of um, associations that have been observed in large data sets and, and have replicated. The associating the microbiome, so saying, OK, sick people tend to have these types of microbes or these types of microbial genes is interesting, but it doesn't really get it cause and effect. So one of the big pushes in my lab right now is to ask why the microbiome is different in disease. Was that a response to the disease state, or was it actually playing a causal role? And to do that, we have to do longitudinal studies and look at people over time, or do studies in the lab, for example, with mouse, mice, or other models of disease, and ask whether the microbiome changes first, and then you start seeing the disease, or if it's the other way around. And can you cause the disease just by changing the microbiome, or alleviate it? 
And the same thing with metabolism of a drug or any other trait that you might want to look at. The, the promise here, which I think is really interesting and really amazing, is that because the microbiome can, be, can change so easily, I mentioned going from a meat to a vegan diet can change the microbiome within 24 hours because it's so easily manipulated. It could be a much better therapeutic target than trying to target a human genetic cause of disease. So gene therapy has had some success, and perhaps we'll have more um, in the coming years with genome editing techniques that have recently been developed. Um, but it would still be pretty challenging to go in and edit someone's human genome to fix a genetic disposition to a disease. But if uh, you could just take a particular yogurt or probiotic um, or change your diet and have an effect on the microbiome that would change your disease risk or alleviate a bad response to a drug, that's something that can much more easily be manipulated that's not very invasive. Um, so it ha there's a lot of promise. And also, just traditional drug development, like taking a protein and have it change how some protein in the human body works, we can also do that uh, to target microbial proteins. So without even changing the community, we could also drug the microbiome, essentially. So I think there's a lot of potential. Um, but what I want to talk about for the next um, part of the talk is um, a different idea, which is that um, the microbiome um, isn't just causing disease, but is actually protecting us from disease. That there's a lot of components of the microbiome that are um, healthy, and that disease might be caused just by losing microbes, not by gaining bad ones, but losing good ones. So there's a hypothesis that's been around for a long time. I didn't come up with this, but um, I'm very interested in it. And the idea is that we evolved over millions of years with a lot more microbes than most of us have in our bodies now because modern life has eliminated a huge component of the microbiome. So it's like removing an organ from our bodies, essentially, and we're all living still. But there are a number of diseases that have sort of rapidly and unexplicably uh, risen in abundance in industrialized countries. And the, the strongest example are the autoimmune diseases, the, including things like allergies and asthma, inflammatory bowel diseases, um, MS. So all these auto-inflammatory diseases, it's hypothesized, could be um, the result of losing a big component of our microbiome. And I'm really interested in this scientifically, but also personally, because I have two autoimmune diseases. I'm a patient, and there aren't really any good explanations for my disease or any, um, you know, there's sort of things to help me get by, but there aren't really any cures. And so I'm really also, as a patient, excited that this, about this line of research. Um, so, um, We've started to do some work looking at the microbiomes of people who aren't exposed to as much antibiotics and uh, such a clean uh, lifestyle. So this is a picture of um, students who um, went to South Africa. And we actually piggybacked on a project that was there to study the human genetics of Khoisan hunter-gatherers. So these are people living in South Africa in a lifestyle like our ancestors had uh, thousands and thousands of years ago. They don't have routine access to medical or dental care. They eat a really different diet than someone in an industrialized country. Um, they don't brush their teeth, et cetera. So, um, this team from Stanford, friends of mine, were um, Carlos Bustamante's lab and others were going over to study the human genetics of these people. And the student um, who was sort of shared with my group um, came to lab meeting and said, that really sucks. We have all this bacterial contamination in our samples. And some of them, it's like 85% of our DNA isn't human. It's bacterial. And I said, don't throw that away. I want to look at it. Um, so a postdoc from my lab got busy with the contamination. And what we found was that some of the most abundant, um, not surprisingly, but um, uh, we found that some of the most abundant organisms in these Khoisan people, and I'm sorry, the data isn't really easy to see, but the, the result is stated in words there. We found some of those most abundant organisms in these hunter-gatherers are rare or completely absent from people in this study. I label HMP as Human Microbiome Project. That was hundreds of individuals living in the United States. Um, so 
this was our initial foray. Um, and then, as I noted earlier, there have been some other people, um, friends, um, who've studied people in other parts of Africa. And um, there's been a great study in Peru of two different groups, one of hunter-gatherers, like these Khoisan people, and another of agriculturalists, um, neither living a very modern lifestyle, but different lifestyles from each other. And they've generated a ton of data. And at this point, there's over 3,000 of these shotgun metagenomic experiments from people from different parts of the world. The majority are from China, North America, and Europe. But we're now getting some data from other parts of the world. And what my lab has done is a big meta-analysis. So we, data, you know, we downloaded or mined all this data and then uh, analyzed it together with um, not the ways it was necessarily analyzed in the original studies, but in bulk to deal with a lot of the confounding issues I talked about earlier, and then asked how the microbes look. Are they the same in different people, or do they look different depending on where in the world you're from? And we did this for each of um, every um, common uh, microbiome constituent. So here's one example. This is Eubacterium rectale. It's common in the human microbiome. and um, there's a map there showing the sampling locations with the little Google dots on it. And um, there's a phylogenetic tree that I've just overlaid on the map. Its exact position on the map doesn't matter. This is just a visual representation. But the colors of the dots represent where the person came from um, whose microbiome was sampled. And the uh, tree is showing how related they are. So if things are close together in the tree, then those two people's microbiomes were really similar. So, and um, not overall, but specifically for this species of bacteria. So for this species, we see a lot of structure. For example, the yellow dots over there, which are all uh, Chinese individuals, form their own clade in the tree. So everyone in China has a Eubacterium rectale that's more similar to other people in China than to anybody in another place. The individuals from the southern hemisphere are pretty different from everybody else. And the North American and European clades are mixed together. So there's a lot of exchange of the different strains between Europeans and North Americans. There's sort of different groups there. But if you look, they're kind of a mix of Europe, people from Europe and people from North America. So that's what this microbe looks like. But then we go to a different species. This is Bacteroides uniformis. And um, it wasn't found at all in the people in the southern hemisphere. So the Asian, uh, sorry, the um, African or the South Americans, it was, wasn't present as far as we could tell in them. But if you were from North America, Europe, or China, you just had kind of a random strain. So these strains were all closely, pretty closely related, not that closely related. But they didn't form any geographic, there was no geographic pattern at all. This thing gets around this particular species. And a new strain arises in it, at least in the northern hemisphere, is spreading all around to different people. So if you're living here in California, your strain could look the most sim person in the world with the most similar strain to you could be in China. Um, but that isn't the case for this other microbe. That would be highly unlikely that someone in China would have the same rectale as you. Um, so we thought this was really interesting that there was a geographic signal for some microbes and not for others. Um, and we're also now looking at non-human primates. So sort of back to my original research program of humans versus chimps, we're looking in chimps and gorillas and baboons to see how they fit in. And so far, it looks like they have pretty different microbiomes than we do, and that the people in the non-industrialized countries look more like the non-human primates. So that's probably like our ancestral microbiome. And then those of us in the more uh, industrialized countries have, have a divergent microbiome that's changed from an ancestral state. So that's our hypothesis right now, and we're, um, we're continuing to work on that. So um, just the last thing I wanted to mention is that our main focus is the human body, but microbes are the major constituents of most ecosystems. And there is some work in my lab that's looking in natural environments as well. And even less is known about the microbes that are there. So actually saying that 1% of the microbes in the human body have ever been studied by traditional micro microbiological techniques, it's less than that if you go out and sample um, you know, out in the San Francisco Bay or on the windshield wipers of your car or out in the desert somewhere. So, um, and yet the microbes are playing really important roles in, bio in ecosystem services and global warming. Um, and also um, 
they help to mediate things like oil spills. Some microbes can eat toxic things and, and totally help out with these natural disasters. Um, there's microbes that are still chewing away at all the mercury that's up in the Sierra Nevada from mining um, during the gold rush and slowly degrading a lot of the mercury and other metal, heavy metal toxins that are up there. So it would be helpful from an ecological perspective to also know who's there and what, what they're doing. So these same tools are being applied to natural environments. And just really briefly, I wanted to show you, I won't talk too much about the modeling, but the, the challenge, the human body is complicated enough to sample. Something like um, the world's oceans is massive. Microbes are tiny. The oceans are massive. There's, if there's trillions of microbes in each of our bodies, imagine how many are in the world's oceans. So we have sort of sparse sampling of what's out there. And one of the approaches my lab has used is to try to build models to predict what's going on in places where we haven't sampled yet. So um, a couple years ago, we had a paper where we used this technique to reconstruct an essentially extinct ecosystem called tall grass prairie, which used to cover the Midwestern United States before um, before so many people were there and before agriculture, monoculture basically destroyed this ecosystem. And we did that by sampling in graveyards where the tall grass prairie hadn't been disturbed and in some nature preserves, where the only places where the tall grass prairie still exists. Built a model for which kind of microbes you find in which kinds of soil. And then used um, what we think that the climate and other properties of the soil were before agriculture and predicted what microbes you would find where. And this is just a, a heat map that's showing um, the diversity. So the warmer colors would be like a more diverse community of microbes would be found in certain parts of the Midwest compared to others. So we did this modeling. Um, we're also thinking forward. So if you can build a model like this, you can predict for soils or air or the oceans what the microbes will look like in future climate scenarios. So we've been doing a lot of that. And it looks like as the Earth warms, the microbes are going to like it. And we're going to get more diversity in, across most of North America, Tibet, a lot of the world's oceans. So, um, so that's something to keep in mind. And one particular health consequence is that particular um, microbes that have um, effects on humans, such as fungal allergens in air, may change as climate changes. So this is. Um, a study where we uh, sampled on the door sills of people's houses. It's sort of a great passive collector for what's in the environment. And because most people don't clean on the top of their door sills. And um, it was called the Thousand Homes Project. We had a bunch of collaborators. But anyway, people, it was a citizen science project. People sampled their own door sill and then sent the, the, sequen the samples in, and we sequenced them. And a lot of things were discovered in that data, but this analysis focused on fungal allergens. So you can see if there's DNA from fungi that are known allergens. And so we mapped where the allergens were found across the United States. And then we, in these pictures, what we did was we plugged in values for future climate scenarios. And what this is showing is the change in the amount of microbes. So for this particular, I'm just showing a few examples, but for this um, Ipecacum nigrum, which is a uh, pretty wicked pathogen and, and can kill immunocompromised people, we see in red a bigger, red would be an increase in the amount of it. So California is going to get a lot more nigrum in the future than it has now, um, as well as the south. Other places might get less, as shown in blue. And then this other species, Alternaria, is mostly decreasing, but it looks like Florida is going to get pretty hit by this one. So we can make those kind of predictions as well. So um, to wrap up, um, getting back to the, the human health angle and our own biology, just a couple summary points about what the field has learned so far. I feel like it's just very early days for this field of research. There are a lot of technical problems we're still trying to overcome. But we've already observed that we uh, can't explain human biology completely by just looking at our own human DNA and that our individual microbial communities are certainly um, playing a complex role in our health and our normal day-to-day -day life. And what makes us human or makes us who we are isn't just our own DNA, but also the DNA of the particular microbes we are carrying around at any given time. This is not fixed. We're not stuck with it for our whole life. It's manipulatable. And so it's likely that healthcare in the future will actually be leveraging this to diagnose you 
and potentially treat you um, it is an alternative to more invasive um, things like drugs or surgery. So um, that's where we're looking um, towards the future. I think there's a lot of promise, but I also think there's a lot of challenges. So um, I'd, I'd be really excited for uh, collaboration with anyone here who has ideas about how to work on the field, and I'm very happy to take any questions. So thanks. Hi. Is there a certain aspect of the data that is less confounded or has less technical problems uh, in, the, in current days? Like if I would go read papers now, yeah. what would I believe more than not? It's a great question. So um, let's see if I can explain what I think one of the biggest problems is. It's, it's pretty, pretty technical, but let me give it a shot. So the common thing that someone does, let's say, to say how much of bacteroides uniformis do you have to quantify that is that they look at the 50 million sequencing reads and see how many of those align to uniformis, maybe normalize that count a little bit, and then divide by the total sequencing library. So it's the proportion of your sample that came from that bacterium. And unfortunately, what we really care about is something about the community, like what proportion of the cells were of that type. And it turns out the proportion of the sequencing reads isn't a very good estimate of the proportion of the cells. And I'll try to explain a couple of the reasons why. One is that the different organisms will have genomes of different sizes. So something with a really big genome, like a yeast, or like a fungal allergen, could take up a whole bunch of your sequencing library, but there might only be a few cells there. The human DNA is in there. So I mentioned that the student thought the bacteria was a contaminant of his human genetic study. We think of the human DNA as a contaminant of the microbial study. And it can be up to like half of the sample. So if half your library just went to human, that can kind of skew the ratios. Um, so that as the genome sizes of the organisms change, the amount of contamination from human or from the lab process, um, Unfortunately, one of the kits for this used for extracting the DNA uh, biases the ratios of different types of organisms. So what can you trust? I would say um, any, if you see in a paper that something measured the actual cellular abundance or cellular relative abundance like of an organism, I would believe that as something really quantitative and comparable, but not the sort of proportion of the sequencing reads. And so um, that's not sort of like a field of inquiry that's reliable, but um, a, a statistic that I think is really reliable. Um, you'd have to dig down a little bit to find that, obviously. Um, but I, I wish I could say that, like, say, high-level things were easier to estimate, like the amount of a particular file. You might not get a specific species right, but you might get like the phylum, you know, a higher taxonomic resolution. I actually don't think that's the case. Um, and I actually think studies that drill down on one specific thing and quantify it very carefully probably do better than the ones that are sort of trying to get everything right. Um, I also think um, that uh, right now, studies that do this experiment of sequencing, just all the random sequences, are still a lot of them are problematic. But some people are going in and targeting specific things and sequencing those. In general, that's probably more reliable, like more targeted studies. I think that the, the unbiased approach has a lot of promise, but we're not quite there yet on a lot of the analytical tools. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah, OK, great. Any other questions? You were just talking about um, a lack of analytical tools. I'm yes. curious to know like, what, what are, where are the biggest gaps and, and what kinds of technologies are you guys currently developing or would like to develop? Yeah, great question. So um, we're developing a lot of tools um, for these normalizations that I mentioned, adjusting for the size of the genome. So trying to estimate and then adjust for the size of the genomes in the sample and the amount of contamination and other sorts of biases. Um, those are kind of under the hood. Um, and they're, um, they're, they require someone to be like a command line programmer to run them. But uh, actually, what I wanted to show you was um, that something that I thought might be interesting. We're basically um, trying to make this research accessible to other people, because my lab can't think of all the interesting questions to ask or 
you know, have time to ask all of them of the data. So we've, um, we've downloaded every microbiome study that's ever been done. There's over 3,000 now. Um, and we've, we think as accurately as currently can, quantified the amount of every protein family and every microbe in them. And then we've compared them across these 3,000 samples, some of which have diseases or from different parts of the world or different aged individuals or males versus females. We've computed all that as like a pre-compute, and then we've built this tool so people can search the data and just pull out the answers. And so let's see. Um, it's a search tool. You can search right here by a gene, and we're adding something that would be more like a Google search where you search by a word like obesity or enzyme you know, or ABC transporter. Um, so we're still working. That'll be out in, in another month or two, expanding the search aspect of it. And then um, here, I think if I'm online, I can show you these are just jobs that have run recently. So I can pull up a job and show you. This is in development right now, so it's not beautiful. But um, someone searched a gene sequence. Um, and then uh, these are things that we think it might be. So these are like possible annotations of it. This is a quantification of how common it is in the human microbiome. Um, so people, uh, some people have no copies of this in their microbiome, some of the samples. And the, the sample with the most of this gene had uh, 2.3 copies per organism in their microbiome. So they had organisms that had multiple copies, on average had more than two copies of this gene. So people vary a lot. Uh, these are some of the taxa that have the gene, some of the bacteria that are carrying it. And then you can look at uh, associations with different traits. So let's see if I can find one. This is statistically significant, what country you're from. So I can click on it. And it looks like. It's this gene is more common in the microbiomes of people from North America compared to Europe or Asia. Um, so um, we've pre-computed all these, and these can just be queried by somebody. So, um, so that's one of the tools that we're working on, as well as the under the hood tools for making sure the numbers that go into these tests are accurate quantifications. All right, well, I'm happy to stick around if anybody wants to chat afterwards. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you.